Uganda is a country that holds 30 million people. 50% of these people are children under the age of 15. 30% of these children can afford school. One in three have access to clean, safe water. 51% of the Ugandan population lives on less than $1 a day. There are an estimated eight physicians for every 100,000 people. These are the numbers. Michael is a five-year-old little boy on death's doorstep. His face is swollen from malnutrition. His hair is white, his growth is stunted, his skin is peeling off. His stepmother refuses to feed him or bathe him or hardly look at him. Michael is a real person. He is my friend and he is God's child. I have been urged to stand here today and read you a list of numbers. The percentages up and down, the number of children we have educated, the number of children we have fed, the number of children we have led to Christ. And while those are all incredible things, love is not about numbers. Love is about real people. Grace is an 80-year-old woman, blind and all alone. The cold rain drips through her roof and onto her face, which she covers with a plastic bag. AIDS makes it impossible for her body to fight off any infection. Malnutrition makes it impossible for her to sit up, let alone walk. Today, Grace is an 80-year-old woman loved by many and loving the Lord with her whole heart. Grace is warm in her hospital bed. With the help of medicine and Jesus, she has gained weight, she is able to stand up, and she has partially regained her sight. Today, Grace is still dying, but today she is dying with love, with dignity, and with a place prepared for her in heaven. Grace is a real person. She is my friend, and she is God's child. Angelina is a seven-year-old little girl who weighs 25 pounds. Skeletal and emaciated don't even do her small frame justice. She can hardly hold up her head. She cries constantly in hunger and in pain. And her mother, who has no money for food, gives her a drink of her dad's beer to numb her back to sleep. Today, with intense love and care, Angelina has almost doubled her weight, is walking, and is laughing. She is attending preschool, she is eating three nutritious meals a day, and she has her medical care paid for. Angelina's mom, Veronica, is working in partnership with Amazima and 147 million orphans to make beads, which she sells to make a sustainable income for her family. She uses this income to feed her children, to send them to school, to clothe them, and to save for their future. Angelina and Veronica are real people. They are my friends, and they are God's children. Christine is an 18-year-old girl who has fled 600 miles from northern Uganda, where she has been plagued by war for the last 12 years. Tired of living and starving in a displacement camp, she's looking for a brighter future. She shows up at my door barefoot and broken. Today, Christine is a 20-year-old woman and the most joyful woman you will ever meet. Christine is my sister and my best friend. Christine is my housekeeper in the morning, and she trains other women and young mothers how to be housekeepers so that they can also go and seek jobs. In the afternoon, Christine attends university where she is studying to be a social worker. This year, she will graduate, and she will join the Amazima staff full-time in serving our children. Patrick is a father working round the clock to make ends meet. Even working over 100 hours a week, he can barely make enough to put food on the table for his six little girls and the two that his brother left behind, let alone send them to school. Patrick grieves his daughter's future that will look like his own, uneducated and working tirelessly to make ends meet. Today, Patrick has trained hard and he is working on staff full-time with Amazima. He's one of our program directors. 
His children are enrolled full-time in a Mazima's sponsorship program where they receive free education, three meals a day, medical care, and spiritual encouragement. Patrick saves every penny he makes for the future of his family. Patrick and his family are real people. They are my friends, and they are God's children. Agnes is a nine-year-old little girl. Her parents have died from HIV, and she has become the mother of her seven- and five-year-old sisters. She wakes up before it is light and walks the scary path to the garden to forage for food. When she comes back, she has to make the three-mile trip twice to the well to have enough water for her sisters to bathe. Agnes is lonely, and she wishes that someone would take care of her, but instead she finds herself a caregiver. Today, Agnes is my daughter. She is feisty and stubborn, has a smile that lights up the room, and the voice of an angel. Agnes dreams to be the next director of Amazima Ministries, and by that time, I just might let her. <laughs> Agnes is a real person. She is my daughter, and she is God's daughter. Amazima Ministries is about love, and love is about real people, real hearts, real lives that are being changed. Amazima Ministries will not single-handedly change Uganda, but 1,600 children loved and poured into by Amazima Ministries will. I am blessed every day to get to plant seeds, to watch my employees and my volunteers water seeds, and to watch God grow them to fruitation. I will not change Uganda, but seeds planted and grown by God will. I struggled with how I was going to organize this speech, not wanting to forget anything because this year God has grown those seeds so much faster than I could have ever asked or imagined. In our sponsorship program, we currently have 400 children who are sent to school, fed, educated, and encouraged spiritually by Amazima Ministries. My greatest joy is the opportunity to teach this, these children who have no earthly father, that they have a heavenly father who loves them dearly. Previously, all the children were coming to my yard, which we had far outgrown every Saturday for Bible study and lunch. This year, we were able to buy land for a fellowship site. We built on it a kitchen, a toilet, a storage closet, <laughs> and a home for Patrick, one of our program directors. Today, instead of seeing 400 children squeeze into my tiny yard, they are fed and taught in a large open field where they can run and laugh and dance. We are also in the process of building a pavilion on the land where the community will gather together to be taught about health, farming techniques, and even have Bible studies. We've just purchased the land behind the fellowship site, and I'm excited to announce that we are beginning to build a playground there. In an effort to have this playground impact more than one aspect of the community, we have hired 30 unemployed, uneducated men to build it. There is currently a volunteer there with his degree in architecture and engineering who has spent the last two months training these men and teaching them God's word. They are now equipped so that we can hire them to build the playground, and they are equipped to go forward in the future and have more job opportunities. Most importantly, I pray that they have seen the love that we have for them and know the love that Jesus has for them as their Savior. In Masesi, where I mentioned we had started an educate, education and feeding program last year, we've seen a 60% increase in the number of children that are going to school and an 80% decrease in the number of children that are begging on the streets. We've not only been able to feed these children and share the love of Christ with them, but we are trying to get their mothers involved. We have a group of 20 ladies who are making paper bead necklaces to sell in partnership with 147 million orphans. 
There's an interview on the video we're about to see of Todi, one of the women sharing how this has really changed her life. And it has been such an incredible blessing to be able to watch the transformation. The income these ladies are making from these necklaces has provided them with an opportunity to move away from other work they were doing that was harmful for their families, such as prostitution, alcohol brewing, and picking through the trash. These women have such strong faith, even with so little. And my greatest joy is every Tuesday when they anxiously pile into my van to go to the bank and put money in their new savings accounts. This is the part where I'm supposed to talk about how I would like a Mazima to grow. And um, while I have dreams and plans of my own, I think that it's been made very clear to me that God has other, bigger, better plans and dreams. I do know that instead of expanding and expanding and adding more and more people and becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, Amazima wants to focus on the children that are in our program now and effectively pouring into those children to make them stronger and stronger and stronger. Because the unemployment rate in Uganda is so high, it's nearly impossible to get a job without a university education. Instead of dropping these kids at 18 or 20, like some other programs, we want to be able to provide for these kids until we see them get a job that can sustain them. This year, we put aside money and sent our first two children to university, and we are very, very excited to see what the Lord has in store for them. I want to ask you to come with me on a journey, a journey that started three years ago when I thought I knew what my life would look like, and I had no idea. A journey that has shown me more about the Father's heart and his extravagant compassion than I could have ever imagined. A journey that requires me to give more of myself every single day. It's a journey that took me from a 10-month commitment to teach kindergarten in Uganda to a lifetime commitment of bettering and serving this country. It's a journey that took me from trying and trying and trying to raise the funds to put 40 children through school, to running a huge ministry that serves 1,600 children and their families. It's a journey that took me from being the temporary foster mother to three children to being the permanent adoptive mother of 14. <laughs> and the journey is not over yet. It is a journey that taught me so much and is still teaching me so much about Jesus' heart for the poor. And I have felt his grief over people who neglect that. Jesus does not ask that we care for the less fortunate. He demands it. When calling, calling ourselves Christ followers, caring for orphans and the desolate and the widow are not an option. It's a requirement. I would like you, I would like to invite you to come with me on this journey that is so far from over and see what God will do next. A lot of people like to tell me that I am courageous. I want to be the first to tell you that it's not all that true. 